adoption rates. You have reduced, by doing the right thing, the TB slaughter rate of cattle in this country by 13.6%. The Welsh Government over five years have brought it down by 48%. Now tell me something, something is going very wrong here. And the last piece of the puzzle is the level of disease in badgers. Owen Patterson and our friends at the National Farmers Union have been demonizing badgers for years. The more that you make people fearful of badgers, the more you want to kill them. Simple as that. So what do you do? First of all, you exaggerate the level of disease in the animal. Well, the randomized badger cull, those 11,000 badgers told us two important things. Firstly, the number of animals in that study that had late stage TB more than one visible lesion where the animal was knowingly, you could see visibly ill, where it would be possibly excreting the disease, a danger to other badgers and cattle, was 1.65% of the 11,000. The 14% of the animals had low stage TB, no visible lesions, but indications from blood tests that they were carrying the virus. They would live most of their natural lives, which on average is three or four years, without showing any major symptoms of ill health and not spreading the disease or being a major risk. 85% of the animals had no disease whatsoever. But when our friend Owen Patterson blew 10 million quid of your money, killing those badgers down in Somerset and Gloucestershire, he tested none of them. And the reason he gave is because, oh, we already know the results. No, Owen, you know the results, but you don't want to test them again, because we all know the results this time round, and we'll tell you that's a huge waste of money. So we know most of those animals are not highly diseased. And the interesting thing is now the Northern Ireland government have worked that out and last week have announced a one and a half million pound project where they're going to start testing animals and actually returning those to the wild through a vaccination program that don't carry the disease. Now they've admitted their test systems will only pick up the animals with late stage TB. And if they do, they said they will euthanize those animals in a humane way and take them out of the, the, the population. But I can tell you now, the chances are they probably won't find any more than the 1.65% of the animals they deal with within the randomized badger call that fall into that category. So a vast majority of those animals will be returned vaccinated. Now vaccinating badgers is worth doing because by vaccinating them, you build up antibodies in the cubs that are being born you reduce the transmission risk for the animals that do not have the disease. Yes, you cannot cure a diseased badger. But on average, the animal's running a risk with disease, with weather, with getting killed on the road. So if you're vaccinating over a five-year period, the diseased animals would have largely died out in that process of time. And you would have got to those who don't have the disease. And you'll be building up antibodies. The herd effect that works in the UK population through the same BC injection that we've had at school to really make a difference. And then we come to cattle vaccines. The other big debate is why aren't we vaccinating our cows against TB? Well, let me tell you something. There is another dark side to our farming industry. Most of the big farming industry interests in the National Farmers Union don't want to vaccinate cows against TB because they're worried they will lose export markets for live cattle and for meat and dairy foods, not just to Europe, but to Russia and particularly to China. China, we come back to. I spoke about it as a massive rising economy at the beginning on elephants. It's also having an impact on our badger debate too. There is a lot of money to be made by selling dried milk and other dairy products and meat products into the Chinese market. To such a degree that China is probably going to buy up most of Co-op's 40 farms that are going on the market at the moment. As an example of where they're going to invest to actually ensure they can have that supply going back to China. The problem is the Chinese are very risk averse when it comes to anything that might have implications for the health of the food that's being digested. Now, you might say that's lunacy, because I've spent a lot of my time in China, and I can assure you the regulatory controls are not that good, and the incidence of food poisoning and other things are a real problem. But the Chinese are risk-averse from the outside. So if they feel that a cattle has been vaccinated for TB, and if they're worried about the health implications, they won't buy it. And the NFU know they won't buy it, and they know they won't be able to sell it. So what they've done is they've gone really quiet on the vaccination of cattle issue, and they'd rather it go away. But the problem is, unless we start vaccinating cattle against TB and vaccinate badgers against TB and continue to come down on the biosecurity elements, we will never stop this disease getting out of control and continuing to become a problem. If we do all those things over the next five years, we will bring it down to levels which are extremely low and there'll be no need, no need to kill any badgers at all. It's as simple as that. That's good for farmers. That's good for wildlife, and I think it's what a vast majority of caring, compassionate people, people like you, that come and support centres like this want to see. And that's why the Badger Army was born. Because what we saw in this debate was something that surprised our friends in government, surprised our friends in the National Farmers Union, surprised our friends in the Countryside Alliance, 
people were not going to sit quietly by and allow these guys to send pest controllers into our countryside at night to start blasting away at a protected species. They were going to get off their backsides, they were going to start making some noise, and they were going to make themselves heard. Now, over the last nine months, we have held nearly 20 marches up and down cities in this country, from London, Bristol, Leeds, Derby, Brighton, across this nation, the biggest rolling wildlife campaign in Europe in decades that has brought together tens of thousands of people, many of whom have never, ever come out and demonstrated about anything in their lives before. They're not the normal eco-warrior element. There are some who would always come and do work for animal rights and be passionate. But a vast majority are actually people that just real, really angry that our taxpayers' money is being wasted, that science is being played around with, that we're destroying a an animal that is not to blame for a disease in our cattle industry. And they're coming out and they're making a stand. But not only are they doing that, they're using social media in a way that we've never seen before. The birth of Twitter and Facebook has been debated, but when it comes to animal welfare and wildlife protection, it's a wonderful tool. Because what we saw in the Badger Cole debate is that people started to link together. They started to lodge freedom of information requests into government on all aspects of this badger call in their hundreds. There's a whole team of civil servants in Whitehall now dealing with FOI requests from the people out there like yourselves that are concerned, who've taught themselves a lot about the ins and outs of this cull. Most of the people that come on our marches are better informed and knowledgeable about bovine TB and about badger culling than any politicians in DEFRA or any politicians in the House of Commons. And that's why the government are on the run. They can't hide the facts anymore about the policing. They can't hide the facts about the dodgy statistics on the disease. They can't hide the facts that the National Farmers Union doesn't want a vaccination policy. All of that is coming out. All the dirty washing is emerging. Every aspect of it is going through wildlife groups like Care for the Wild, Badger Trust, and then getting into the media too. And that's what's dislodged this policy. If we hadn't have campaigned in the way that we did over the last 12 months, we would now be seeing badger calling in 10, 20 different areas of this country this summer. This government wanted to wipe out two, 300,000 of these animals for no reason at all. Now I can tell you that's not going to happen. Badger culling is now political poison. Even most conservative MPs would rather have a nuclear waste dump in their back garden than a badger cull. They know they're not going to go into the polls in 2015 going, hey, I'm your local MP, I support badger culling. It ain't a vote winner, thankfully. And the Liberal Democrats, after all their wiggling in government, suddenly found a backbone when it came to the extension of the badger cull. And oh my God, they did try very hard to scare everyone to get this cull. In the last few weeks on that decision, we had a number of stories emerge. We had hedgehogs being destroyed by marauding badgers. We had ground besting numblebees disappearing because of marauding badgers. And then we had the great TB cat story. Now the TB cat story is an interesting one. Those three cases of human transmission of TB from possibly a wild animal. We're over 18 months old. The Health Protection Agency England had that data. But it was Owen Patterson, in his desperation to get this cull to a national level, that put that into the mix at the last minute. His political advisors got Health Protection England, with the support of the Chief Veterinary Officer Nigel Gibbons, to make a statement about the risk. If you read the press release coming out of the government agency, there was no mention about badgers. It said it potentially could have been a wildlife transmission risk. That could have been feral cats, it could have been rats, it could have been cattle, it could have been a number of different sources. But then suddenly, surprise, surprise, the next day it was on the front page of the Daily Mail. And there was a picture of a badger that looked like a Tasmanian devil, of a poor woman looking like she was going to be bitten by this animal, and then the story that we've got TB out of control, and it's all the badger's fault. Complete and utter nonsense. Complete and utter scaremongering to try and make the public think killing these animals was justified. Well, it didn't work. Even our friend Nick Clegg wasn't going to buy that argument. And when it went back to Cabinet, the Liberals in the coalition said, no, we're not going to have it. We don't want any further badger culling at this stage. So what Owen Patterson has now got is a difficult situation on his hands. He knows that there is no political stomach to deliver a badger cull. We also know that the arithmetic is not there for the Conservatives to form a majority of the next government. If they get back in, it will be in probably a coalition with a liberal type alliance once again. They're not going to be able to get the numbers to form their own government to force through badger culling against huge public opposition, or for that matter, to stop and, and take apart the Hunting with Hounds Act and reintroduce fox hunting. So the real world politically is the national coal policy is dead, and we're left with two failed 
pilot coals in Gloucestershire and Somerset that this time round will not even be subject to monitoring. There'll be no monitoring at all. And that's why the Badger Trust is taking that case to the High Court as a judicial review. Because what we're saying is there's no way, A, that you can go ahead and kill these animals with no proper monitoring in place at all. And even if you think you could ever have a national coal policy on the back of that, that will be illegal. Because that contravenes every commitment you made as a government to monitor and scientifically ana analyze every aspect of this cult for its effectiveness, for its scientific efficiency, and for its humaneness. So they're in trouble. The cult policy is in trouble. People have got wind of it. Tens of thousands of people are opposing it. And we're beginning to change the way things happen in this country. We will bring an end to badger culling, but it's not the end of the story about wildlife protection. We've got to do more because there are other animals on the hit list now. Buzzards are on the hit list. Gannets are on the hit list. Cormorants are on the hit list. Our seals are being shot in increasing numbers in Scotland to protect salmon farms. Our buzzards are under threat because of shooting estates. There are numerous species in this country, many of which you will find in this wildlife centre being protected, that are under the threat from our own government. And what happens is every single time there is a vested interest pushing to have them destroyed. It might be housing developers that want badgers gone. It might be shooting estates that want buzzards gone. It might be commercial salmon farms that want seals gone. It might be commercial fisheries, coarse fisheries, that now want our friend the otter gone after so many years of hard work to bring it back. And that's wrong. And our system of government is wrong. And the big debate now going into the next 12 months ahead of this election will be how can we improve our government to protect wildlife? We need a proper independent wildlife protection agency in this country. It should not be part of DEFRA with all those vested interests in the fishing and farming and other industries. It must have a completely independent board, a completely independent budget, and it must have power across all government departments. So, for example, if you're going to build HS2 through prime protected forest, you have to go through the Wildlife Protection Agency first. If you're going to develop a new pesticide, you have to go through the Wildlife Protection Agency first. If you're going to kill badgers for some crazy notion you're going to reduce bovine TB, you have to go through the Health Protection Agency first. We're pushing Labour opposition to take that on board seriously. We're talking to Conservatives, saying, actually, you've made such a mess of this, it would help you to have an independent agency. And the Liberals, finally, thinking about the consequences of their actions, need to focus on this too. But I want to tell you all that it's important that you as individuals speak out. The government acts in your name. Government is not a blank sheet of paper. It's influenced by the democracy in which we live in. Yes, we can all sit quietly by and allow these vested interest groups to destroy our wildlife, or we can make a stand and say we're not going to put up with it. There are 800,000 people in the Wildlife Trust in this country. There are over a million and a half people in the RSPB. There are hundreds of thousands of people that support Care for the Wild, the Badger Trust, and sanctuaries like Vale here. We, together, are a very, very powerful force. We can make a difference, and we will make a difference. We are a caring and compassionate country when it comes to wildlife. It's no surprise that the RSPCA started here in the 19th century. It's no surprise that Commission in World Farming started here. It's no surprise that in one town in Horsham, Born Free and Care for the Wild were established in one charity shop by Bill Jordan, a vet, and Virginia McKenna. 30 years on, both those charities are doing fantastic work in Britain and around the world. And it's no surprise that you have places like Vale Wildlife Sanctuary in this country. Because you've got people here that are committed, like Caroline, that have put their lives into this because they care so much. That's what makes Britain different. Our politicians often bicker about what makes this country great, what makes us stand out from the rest of the crowd. Should we have our own immigration policy, our own economic policy? What's our relationship with Europe? And I say to politicians all the time, the one thing, the one thing that unites this country through generations and all ethnic mixes and backgrounds is our compassion and care for wildlife. We're not Germany, we're not Ireland, we're not the United States, we're not New Zealand, Australia, any of these other countries that our friend Owen Patterson will tell us we should learn from their wisdom when it comes to protecting wildlife. We're Great Britain, we're caring and compassionate, we make a stand for wildlife, we protect it, we know the value of it, and by working together we'll make it a safer place for the future. Thank you very much.